Welcome to the Intelligent Investing Podcast, where modern portfolio theory can suck it. A student of the school of Graham and Doddsville and a clergy member of the Church of Warren Buffett, here's your host, Eric Schlein. Hi, this is Eric Schlein. You're listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast uh, and more from the Coronavirus Investing Series. And we have Jeremy Raper back on the show. Jeremy, welcome back. Hey, hey, Eric. How's it going? It's going okay. Just hunkered down, doing the, doing the best I can to, to stay busy and focused. Uh, how about you? Same, same. I'm back in London, and uh, it's full lockdown over here. So yeah, trying to stay positive, as you as you can imagine, to get through this time. But look, we're we're both very fortunate in the grand scheme of things. So uh, no complaints. yeah, no 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 kidding, right? No kidding. Yeah. So um, I wanted to. I, I know we had talked about GAN uh, quite a few months ago, and there's yeah. there's been some updates since. So. Would you uh, be willing to talk about a little bit of, you know, the, the stock was down a lot and then it's up again. And so there's, there's been a bunch of stuff. Could you give, give us the update on what's going on there? Sure. So and for I mean, full for, disclosure, for I, I'm, I'm a shareholder and my clients are shareholders. So I just get getting that out of the way. Perfect. Uh, perfect. Yes. And I'm also, I'm also long the stock. So, you know, we are both um, believers in the story, but, but let's, um, Let's kind of revisit where, where we picked it up. I think the last time I was on your show, the stock was around 120, 130, and it had pulled back from 160, 170. Um, and uh, I guess for anyone who's new to the story, GAN is a SaaS provider of back-end software solutions for the online gaming, gambling, I should say, and sports betting industry. Um, essentially, they provide a lot of the uh, the player account management software that powers some of the leading um daily fantasy sports sites in the U.S. So that one of their big clients is FanDuel. Uh, and then they have a number of other clients in the U.S. and a couple of clients in Italy and a couple of clients in, in the U.K. Uh, but essentially, they're a software provider to the online gambling industry. So the play with GAN originally was always uh, basically a bet on the massive explosion of online gambling and sports betting in the U.S. Um, as sports betting in particular was legalized in, in New Jersey um, close to 18 months ago and, and more recently in, in Pennsylvania, it's been legal for, I want to say nine, 10 months and Indiana just for a few months. Uh, and most recently Michigan, I believe also signed legislation to bring it into law. So essentially GANs are small cap companies listed in London. Most of the businesses in the U S um, and the implication being as the on the online uh, sports betting and gambling market grows aggressively in the U S they're a natural beneficiary because they're, they're kind of like the uh, the technological version of selling shovels in a gold rush, right? Um, so I think last time I came on, I'm trying to remember exactly when it was, but it must have been after they'd given their guidance for the full year where they said their revenues would be close to double year over year. So it would have been, you know, October or something last year where, you know, the stock went from 80, 90 pence to, to 160, as we discussed in a hurry, came back to 120, 130. And, and I kind of outlined the case for why at that lower level, you know, and, and with pretty general, with, excuse me, with, with pretty conservative assumptions for growth in the broader market and GANs take rates, you know, this thing was still trading on a pretty low forward multiple of, of free cash flow, even out one or two years, right? Um, which which is unusual for, for a very high margin software business, right? It's essentially, you have the platform and as more revenue drops down, as, as more gambling gets done on these sites, they have a royalty take rate, right? So that And that, that varies depending on the game uh, and depending on the, the type of activity. So it's higher for things like online uh, casino gaming, it's lower for things like sports betting, uh, and it's higher still for things like simulated gaming. So as the mix changes, you know, you have a different take rate, but essentially, you know, if you have 10 million people one year and 20 million the next, you know, the cost to service that is the same. The platform's the same, right? So, so it's hugely, hugely positive operating margins and hu- very extremely high contribution margin from incremental revenues once, once you've scaled up, you know, a client like Fangel, for example. So the business model is highly attractive, uh, starting from a low base, given that you expect revenues to grow very rapidly and it's extremely fixed cost. So I think, um, you know, since then, what's happened? Basically, well, well, I guess a few things have happened. Firstly, <laughs> the stock fell out of bed during the recent correction, um, and I think I think there's a few things going on here. Obviously, the the entire market you know fell thirty five percent in in about a month. And casinos, more, you know, casinos have been well, worse. 
well, casinos have been worse, but I think what really drove it is, you know, it wasn't just the fact the market was obliterated. It was that liquidity evaporated, right? So, so what happens in, in liquidity uh, poor environments? Um, basically, what happens is everything that's illiquid or difficult to sell tends to get hit a lot harder than other stuff. Um, and so, obviously, as a as a London Stock Exchange listed stock, but not on the main board, it's listed on the minor board of the stock exchange called the Alternative Investment Exchange. Um, you know, as you know, as someone who's traded this stock for your clients, you know, this stock trades by appointment, right? It only trades four or five times a day during auctions. It doesn't trade in a typical fashion where you can see a bid offer and just uh, trade the stock by pressing a button. You actually have to enter only limit orders. And it only trades during very small prescribed windows each day. Can you can you so go into the, the can you go into the me- mechanics of that? Because you know, on my end, for instance, right, if I put in an order to uh, GAN, yep. as you said, yep. it's, it's a very unusual process where it shows I've put in the order, but that it has not been registered by the exchange yet. Yep, yep. So it's it's an old school way of trading stocks when every stock used to have, you know, uh, book builders and, and, you know, basically on the floor of the stock exchange in New York, every stock used to be traded like this, where you'd have to match bids and offers against each other. And only once that had happened, could you actually execute a trade, which is what the specialists on the floor used to do. Or I guess they still do in certain stocks, but it's, it's all electronic now. For a stock like GAN, uh, it's listed, as I said, on the AIM exchange, where they have each each day they have six or seven daily periods called auctions, which are really only five or ten minute periods during the trading day. So I think the first one is eight fifty a.m., eight fifty to nine a.m., and then there's another one ten fifty to eleven, and then you know twelve thirty to twelve thirty five. So there's you know six or seven of these periods throughout the day, and during those small windows, the appointed market makers in GAN stock will see all the orders that are outstanding bids and offers. Um, that have accumulated up until that point, right? So it's the last hour of trading, and then they'll they'll settle on a closing price for that auction, essentially. Why, why don't so you get computers do that? That's one of the mysteries of life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sure computers are involved in the extent that they use a computer to en- input the orders. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, why they, can't it just be like yeah. in like an OTC market, like we have in the United States? I don't know why, but uh, those are uh, those are the rules. I mean, look, this is one of the main reasons why Gan wants to get off this exchange and onto the Nasdaq, which we'll come to shortly, right? Yeah. But essentially, the, there there are two ways to trade the stock. Either you and I, we I think put it's in a funny, by order. the way, that I'm like asking you for the answer. Of why you know, not, like, like you would like you would like you would have the authority on, on. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 Eric, trust me, my life would be a whole lot better if this stock just traded like any other stock as well. So I definitely didn't set up the rules to uh, function this I've way. I've had but... to be up at odd hours of the night to make sure I got my you know bid into the auction exactly it's it's very i mean look this this is one of the main reasons why the stock is so cheap right people it's very difficult to navigate the system but but essentially if if you're not an institutional client so if you're an institutional client you can call up one of these brokers and say show me an offer or show me a bid i want to buy a hundred thousand shares right so in other words an off exchange transaction so those still do happen but obviously the vast majority of people including you know myself cannot access that because I'm not in the position to buy, you know, a million dollars, two million dollars of stock at a clip, right? So the brokers aren't going to take that call. Um, but, and so I have to like, you know, like you or like others have to have to endure the, the, the torturous auction mechanism. Um, so, so, so that's a big part of it, right? So what, tying it back to why I think the stock went from, you know, it was trading at 195 a month ago. And I think it bottomed at, you know, 60 pence, 70 pence. So it went down, three quarters of its value in, you know, three and a half weeks on absolutely no news at all. No fundamental news. Even, you know, the broader market fell 35%. This fell 70%. Yep. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that you just had a few guys, a few small hedge funds or whoever that just had to sell. Right. I think um, that was the it, case with a lot of stocks that people were heavily margined and were forced. There was a lot of forced selling on the market. I think we, we talked a little bit about that. Yeah, exactly. So there was definitely forced liquidations going on. And, you know, a stock that on the best of days, the stock only trades, you know, a million dollars a day or a million and a half dollars a day. It's super liquid. So it doesn't take many of those to really brutalize the price. Yeah. So that's exactly what happened. Um, but of course, then the company came out, you know, this week and gave an extremely positive trading update. It's probably worth going through that in some detail. So if anyone's interested, they can look at it on the GAN PLC Investor Relations website. But essentially, the company said 
not only is the NASDAQ relisting, which is the key catalyst, as I mentioned, they're, they're kind of delisting the stock from the London exchange and moving to the NASDAQ, where it makes a lot more sense because basically, uh, you know, 60% of the business is now in the US. That'll, that'll move close to 100%. All the interested um, investors are in the US, basically. Um, you know, the, the, basically the head office of the company is, is in California. Uh, and the story, the, the, the growth story of the stock is clearly the U.S. market opening up, right? So it's the natural home for the for the listing. That's going ahead full steam. Um, hopefully, the, the shareholder vote on that will happen uh, imminently, so in the next few days. And then after that, all they need to do is receive SEC approval for the F1, the registration statement, which was filed uh, and is now you know in the hands of the SEC. So that probably comes back in, I'm not sure how long that would take, maybe you know, a matter of weeks, let's say. So there is a, a decent possibility the stock will be listed and, and trading on the NASDAQ by maybe not the end of April, but hopefully early May. Um, so so that's, that's going ahead. And more importantly than that, I suppose, or at least equally important, was the update on the fundamentals. So the, the 2019 earnings were not the full earnings, but I guess the, the, the brief version of the earnings came in. And there were basically, as I expected, there are a few one-time items in there which need to be you know, looked through. But essentially, the, the growth that they had telegraphed came through and the operating leverage that they had telegraphed came through. So that's, that's quite important. The business has no debt, is uh, generating cash, operating margins, or I should say EBITDA margins went up to near 30%, which is what they had guided to. And then they reiterated the outlook for 2020 in extremely bullish fashion. They're basically going to 30% growth in 2020. Um, and most importantly, the character of that growth is changing. So obviously, they, you know, they made a lot of money from sports betting, but sports are now being on hold, being put on hold in the US or globally, I suppose. So they're, you know, they're not going to make any money from events that can't take place. So that's a big negative, and that, that's probably one of the reasons the stock the stock went down. But the, the interesting phenomenon is, with everyone stuck in their home, they've started betting on, you know, blackjack instead. They started online gambling. So, you know, they've noticed that not just Fangio, but a lot of their other clients, for example, their lottery clients in Italy, that, you know, everyone's stuck at home with nothing to do. Their betting has exploded. Um, and so they're poised to actually make a lot more money from this because their margins on some of these other products are much higher than they are in sports. So I think we speculated last time that I thought the take rate on sports is, is quite low yeah. because the profitability of that product is quite low for the, for the online casinos, right? So sports betting is not a hugely profitable product. So obviously the service providers can't make that much money either. But the online gambling products like blackjack or you know slots or roulette or whatever, those are much more profitable products for the casino. No, and as a result, the service provider gets a much bigger taste uh, as well. Um, and more than that, they also announced they signed a new uh, simulated gaming client, Penn National Gaming. It just happens to be one of the largest just um, physical casinos. <laughs> exactly, one of the largest casino operators in the US. Uh, and that's also interesting here because, look, simulated gaming was the, um, the black sheep of the GAM product suite to say, no one could really understand if that was ever going to be worth anything. So, so what's simulated gaming? Well, simulated gaming is where, you look, let's say you, let's say you like to go to uh, Mohegan Sun, right? Uh, and you, you know, you go there. I don't know, once every couple of weeks or once a month, and you, you play, you, you have a game, have a stake dinner, whatever, and you, you know, you join the loyalty program. And then what the casino wants to do is, when you're not spending time at their property, they want you to still engage and remain focused on on the brand so you know they'll push out an app to you right a mohegan sun app um and if it's not actually legal to gamble real dollars you can still play your favorite games on the app using virtual chips right so look you're not playing with real money but you're still engaging with the interface you know you're maybe you're talking to your casino host or whatever through the app or you're you, you're still staying engaged they want to keep you engaged um and they obviously do that to to kind of on you know on a, on a player loyalty basis, right? So if you have yeah. an account with Mohegan Sun and you play a certain number of hours on their app, you, you get some more points. You can gamble those as chips, or you get a discount next time you come in. Things like that. Well, Gan actually manages the backend software for those simulated games, and that's actually a very high margin business for them. And the reason it's so high margin is because obviously there isn't you know the casinos not risking let's quote quote unquote real dollars on that but it's more of a custom acquisition vehicle for them so they essentially gan is getting paid out of the casino's advertising budget yep. is one way to think about that so 
buried in the announce- announcement of the much better than expected 2020 outlook, the full steam ahead on the NASDAQ relisting, um, the solid 2019 results, results, no real huge surprises, um, and the new Penn Gaming client was the fact that simulated gaming has seen a huge uptick in focus from all these casinos because there's nothing, you know, there's no one going to these physical casinos. So what are all these these physical casinos doing? They're trying to keep their players engaged. They're trying to maintain that engagement. Um, so there's been a big dedicate. I mean, this was not something unique to Penn National, but it's it's interesting because Penn's one of the biggest players. Um, this could be a really big opportunity for GAN, maybe not in 2020, but definitely from 2021 onwards, um, as as Penn builds out their sim gaming offering using GAN's technology. So look, I mean, look, the stock, it's been roller coasters, the wrong word. It's more a, a bungee cord has been what, it, what it's been. It went all the way to briefly to 60 pence, bounced back to 100, and now it's back at 140. So it went from 100 to 140 um, on the trading update date. I think at 140, it's still incredibly cheap because think of it this way. I mean, the stock was almost 200 when uh, before coronavirus, um, and it's one of the few stocks where the numbers are actually going to get a lot better uh, through coronavirus, despite the fact the initial take was it wouldn't be worse than than, than before, um, yeah. because the, the margin profile of all these, the margin profile of casino gaming and then sim games are so much higher than sports, right? So if sports goes to zero, but it's dollar for dollar swapped with with blackjack and with sim gaming, you know the margin power for GAN could be double. So so in my model, I, I look, I haven't played around with the model too much. I thought they were going to go from close to 30% EBITDA margins to high 30% EBITDA margins just on the normal operating leverage in the business. I think they'll, they'll should top 40% EBITDA margins in 2020 just on the uh, the product mix shift, um, which means on my numbers, you know, look, I have this thing at under 10 times free cash flow. It's like nine, it's like nine year, times right on now. On this year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, it depends on, it, it depends on a few other things, how much money they actually spend on, on you know developing these systems for the new clients right so 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 there could be some cash out related sure. to to a lot of these they also want to they also want another client that's not insignificant in michigan which has five casinos there so the cat the capex line could be a bit fatter than i expected but i mean this thing's growing 30 percent this year probably grow higher really they're pretty conservative with guidance it could grow 40 percent this year probably grows 30 to 40 percent the year after as well yeah, no, it's a really, it's, it's a really interesting it. business, and it's, it's trading. I mean, the multiples yeah, um, are so low for for you know the any mul- other. The multiples similar- are low. The multiples are very low. It's an attractive business proposition. It's a very hot part of the market. Um, if I was to play devil's advocate and say things I'm worried about, mm-hmm. I would say, look, it's there aren't that many comps to it, right? So, so, so it's a SaaS business in the sense that, as I explained, there's a very low incremental cost for incremental revenue, right? Yep. Um, but there aren't any other SaaS gambling software businesses listed, right? There is only DraftKings is listed, and that's that's a front end operator, so that's not the same business at all. And the, the trades are very high valuation, and it's a retail favorite stock, but it's from an economics perspective, it's it's no in equivalent as a business. Yeah, I mean, then, so it's not then easy the, to, the the counter perspective that I would give you, right? Which I'm sure you've already thought about is. Even if they do get some more competition, I mean, the the risk of casinos losing customers just from switching to a d- different technology is pretty high. I, I heard something like mm. uh, they could lose 40% of their customers just from having them re-input their name and social security number and credit card information and all that, which is, you know, a real, which is a real cost. That's, that's, that's true. That's true. So, so the biggest risk by far for this investment thesis is the idea that FanDuel moves away from them over time, right? So FanDuel at the moment is, well, has on 20 years revenue. Hey, Jeremy, you're, you're, you're much breaking up. I can't hear anything. Oh, okay. can, you, can you hear me? Uh, now I can. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Okay. Is that better? Okay, yeah. Sorry, no, sorry about that. So I was just saying that the biggest risk to the thesis by far is that FanDuel moves away from them, right? So FanDuel is, what, 20% of their revenues last year and probably 50% of their revenues this year. Um, but, um, but, but, but yeah, the, you know, to your point, the, the switching cost for a customer, if they're forced to re-input their credit card details, if they move away from GAN, GAN when they want to do a new deposit, uh, is is pretty high, which you know, in my understanding, would would be necessary if they did cut GAN out from the contract. Yeah, and this you know, this is this has gone into 
Dude, yeah, Jeremy, you're you're once. breaking Since up again. Gan owns a you're, you're breaking up again, Jeremy. Dan, can, can, can you hear me? Mm, not really. No. Try again. Hold, hold on one second. Let me let me walk around here. Sure. Can you can you hear me? Is that better? Yeah, way better. Okay, sorry. We have a few technical <laughs> difficulties today. That's a problem. Um, but but yeah. So so as I was saying, um, you know, essentially, Gan has a patent that covers the linking of the player's account, so the details on the player's account, um, to their wallet. So to your point, if if Gan did get booted by FanDuel, which, by the way, I don't think can happen for a number of years, according to the F1, they have it locked up through 2025 for most of their offerings. But nevertheless, it is a risk if they don't go in new states, and it's also a risk on some of the offerings. So sports betting is, is one of the offerings where it may become a risk later in the year. Um, but to your point, if, if they don't use GAN's wallet for existing customers when they redeposit whatever and they're forced to re-input all their details, then you, it is a point of an additional point of friction and you may lose the customer. So, look, I'm not, I, I'm not betting the house on this name for that reason. Right? It's very difficult to, to bet the house on a name where one customer is you know, 40%, 50% of revenues. Um, having said all that, I, I do think there's enough there to suggest they have a pretty strong um, – a pretty strong relationship that can at least persevere for the next few years while the market explodes in overall growth. And what, what do you, what do you see as the potential of them getting bought out? I used to be much more positive on them getting bought out. Um, my sense is the NASDAQ relisting probably wouldn't have happened if they were going to sell the company, right? Because they, they did run a process to, to potentially sell the company. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the stock was a lot lower than of course. Um, and they decided against it. So I think what probably happened is FanDuel probably did bid them when the stock was, you know, 60, 70 pence. They probably bid them 100 or something. And Dermot, the CEO, thought, well, look, if I just relisted in the NASDAQ, you know, it's worth 150, 200. And that was before the business really took off. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. That was before the business really took off. So at this point, you know, I don't think, uh, look, Fangel could afford to buy them because they're part of a much larger entity, but I think it might just be a secular growth story with some customer concentration risk for now. But, uh, you know, I don't think that's insurmountable. Um, and, and if you think about it, Dermot was buying stock in the market post the trading announcement at one thirty the other day. Um, so he's not buying it at 130 to sell it at 150, right? He's buying it at 130 because he thinks it's worth three, 400 over time. Yeah. Um, I think, look, the market, I mean, there's so much depends on the market. If the market was where we were a month ago and just in terms of sentiment, I think this would easily double just on the relisting from here. Um, given the uncertainty in the broader market and, and then, you know, a lot of the comps have, have come down in value, uh, I'm not sure it trades as well. Having said that, you know, it's an extremely tight float. It's a small company. Uh, it's extremely cheap on any objective measure, uh, and the story is very attractive. So I still think it's undervalued, and I still think it will trade up. I still could see it making new highs easily on the relisting, which is still a highly attractive return from here. Yeah, look, I mean, the volatility in this market is still pretty insane. I mean, I, not only has this happened once, but twice now. I mean, with Aircap, for instance, right, buying at 40, and then a week later, I'm buying at 20. And with GAN, yep. right? I'm I'm buying at like 160, and then I'm buying at 72, and then I'm buying at 140. I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> so. I'm glad you got some at 70. I, 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 put I got some order. around 70 ish. Yeah, that's awesome. I put some. I put an order in at uh, not for me, but for one of my clients. Stock was... <laughs> well, lucky client. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I put an order in at 65 when the stock was 60, I think. And you know, as as we were discussing, I didn't even get any fills because of the auction system. Yeah. So that was a bit annoying, but that's okay. Yeah. All right. Well, interesting. Any other any other thoughts about Gan before we uh, finish up? No, I think I think we covered Gan. I think yeah. We covered Gan completely. All right. Sounds good. Well, Jeremy, I appreciate uh, having you on. Anytime. Thanks, Eric. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast with Eric Schlein. If you'd like to connect with Eric for questions, comments, feedback, ideas, or to inquire about being on the show, please contact Eric at intelligentinvesting at gmail.com. So, in the words of Charlie Munger, I have nothing to add.